versus crypto, uh, digital assets versus crypto assets panel. And I'd like to give everyone on the panel a chance to introduce themselves. So, Ina, we'll start with you. So, I'm Ina Braverman, I'm the co founder of uh, EcoWay Power. Uh, okay, no. So I'm Ina Braverman, I'm the co-founder of uh, EcoWave Power. Uh, our company actually is existent uh, since 2011. Uh, what we do is construction of power stations that produce uh, clean electricity from uh, ocean and sea waves. Right now we're uh, kind of uh, combining our uh, existing technology, which is the production of wave energy with the blockchain world. So we're basically issuing a security token called the EcoWave Coin. Uh, through which uh, anybody can actually have access to funding of clean renewable energy uh, power stations. And that, I'll tell you a bit more in the next questions. And Mark? Yeah, hi there. My name is Mark. Um, I'm originally a tech entrepreneur. I founded and exited two own companies, moved into the investment space in 2010. Um, read the white paper of Satoshi in 2012 and since then I'm in Bitcoin and the whole crypto asset space and I'm involved mainly as a board member and investor in a few crypto projects at the moment. And Andre. Yes, uh, uh, good morning everyone. I'm glad to be here. My name is Andre Kalajuk. I'm a the serial entrepreneur, built 10 builds businesses in the telecom media technology field and uh, actually also the founder of Aventures Capital. It's a VC fund investing in the startup out of the Eastern Europe, and we bring them to US. Uh, some, of the, some of them actually uh, 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 doing products with a blockchain uh, use, and uh, I'm also still the, the founder of the, and chairman of the board of Divan TV that actually shifted their business model in seven years old video streaming platform with the use of blockchain and uh, I'm a strong believer in, the, believer in the token economics, so hopefully we're also going to talk today about it. All right, so uh, to start the conversation, I think it's very useful to get a sense of how we define digital and crypto assets. So I guess, Mark, if we could start with you, how you would personally define uh, crypto assets as well as physical assets. Yeah, I mean, being quite straightforward, everything you can touch seems to be physical, and everything which is not touchable seems to be digital. All right, and do you have anything to add to that, Andre? Well, same, uh, the, uh, but uh, everything becomes digital, even if it has physical. So I believe in this uh, twin, uh, twin, uh, twin, uh, uh, twin, I'm sorry, I just arrived 4, 4 a.m. in the morning from the, from the London, so I've got to be slow. So I believe that everything is physical and digital in terms of the uh, tokenization is going to be digital. And do you find that many of the tools that uh, came into investing into digital assets of the past, such as, say, uh, intellectual property, uh, brands, trademarks, things like that, uh, that aren't physical assets, Will those concepts be able to be applied in this crypto blockchain world? Yes, I think so. And uh, if you're talking about the physical assets, the most valuable one is actually human being. It's us, yeah? We are physical, right? But we are create things, right? They are digital. And uh, uh, this is why I believe that human beings that actually are able to create things in the digital world are also going to be tokenized. Of course, we hear the stories about the uh, stars, but actually every human being, maybe somebody in this room is the next, I don't know, Vitalik Buterin, right? And the guys actually want to create something, and obviously something digital, right? And we would be interested to support this guy, right? But actually, the guy will say, I want to tokenize myself as a human being because I'm going to create the things in the digital world. So this is going to be inevitable happening to the all human beings that are actually able to create things. Now, would you also consider the blockchain as an extension of past digital assets, or would you consider anything blockchain related would be its own category? Like, can you put them in the same category, or should they should we differentiate between digital, new digital, and old digital? Well. Blockchain is a technology that enabled, right, that transformation on one hand, but then the other one we actually created the new universe, right, related to the crypto. So, which of course 
uh, has a big impact on the physical world as well. And then, uh, Ina, in your business um, ventures, how have you um, worked with um, physical assets in the past, and then how are you incorporating digital assets yeah. into them now? So basically, in the past, uh, in the past, and now our company is building uh, power stations that do clean electricity, renewable energy, all over the world. Uh, in the past, like in the traditional sense of the physical assets, uh, basically, not everybody had access to renewable energy projects all over the world. So mostly, the investors would be like big banks or venture capital firms or the European Union that is interested to promote renewable energy. Once basically it become, uh, became digitalized, we can actually put our power station, create the asset back token and put kind of the power station in a digitalized form. Actually, everybody has access to supporting renewable energy, to supporting the fight against climate change. Everybody can enjoy revenues directly driven from that asset without having to go and invest in a company that goes public, holding the shares, having to understand you know, the P&L and all the complexity that is involved in uh, regular investment. You can actually invest in an asset, understand exactly how much money you're going to do, and do something good for the world in the same time. So it kind of, you know. But does the digital asset itself mm -hmm. help you renew energy more efficiently? Or is it just a way to finance? The uh, different sectors. It's the way. First of all, it's a way to finance. Second of all, it's the way to create transparency because one of the biggest, uh, let's say, claim against renewable energies is that most uh, renewable energy companies, even the billion dollars one, the, the huge solar and wind companies, they never published how much energy they actually produce. So through the blockchain, we can actually create complete transparency. So everybody that holds a token can receive in real time data on how much energy is produced and how much money they're making. So that's something that didn't exist before. So it definitely helps the globalization and the acceptance of uh, renewable energy in my case and it helps to give access to the general population to those type of projects. Yeah, I think that's a very good example where you see these two worlds uh, converging, right? I mean you have something very abstract like energy which is physical but ultimately also quite digital because mm -hmm. you don't really touch the energy, right? So you make it public, visible, more efficient, more transparent, so I think you're in a space which really converges a little bit both of these worlds. Okay, and then Mark, as a serial entrepreneur uh, exiting several firms, um, have you, how have you specifically used um, blockchain or digital assets in any of your successes? Yeah, I mean, my, I, I founded my first company in 1999, so back then uh, it was not really about blockchain, but I think we're in a very similar situation like back then. I mean, everybody's talking about blockchain and the technology and everything around it, but honestly, most people, they don't and they shouldn't care. I mean, we need use cases uh, which are somehow built on the technology. And back then in 1999, it was also the TPC, HTTP protocol behind, but honestly, nobody cared. And I think that's why Everybody or most of the people here in the room, they are somehow connected to the blockchain as a technology. And I think um, it enables a lot of additional use cases, but ultimately to become successful, I think uh, at least the end customer, they don't really care what's, what's behind. So if um, you're saying we're, like history does repeat itself, and if you see something similar to kind of the dot-com boom of internet when every online media company that came out and video streaming was successful right away, what principles did you learn navigating that time that you think would apply to people today that are starting their companies? A little bit what I already said. I mean, technology is the foundation, and um, you use it or you have to use it to create new use cases. But ultimately, um, I think we reached a tipping point when at least the, the mass adoption is not about the technology anymore because it's just part of the real added value you're offering. So I think we should, I mean, we should talk about technology, but ultimately I think uh, the users, they don't care. So that's why we should far more talk about what are real use cases which generate additional value and I think like back in 1999, there were so many uh, business cases which were ultimately not succeeding because they were just trying to somehow create something based on this new fancy internet. And we have a very, situation, very similar situation right now that you have everything is somehow blockchain related. 
but uh, it should be far more about what's really in it and what's the added value. That's actually a really good point. Um, Andre, you have questions? Yes, uh, actually I totally agree with Mark. And uh, uh, in terms of the use cases, for example, you mentioned video streaming. That's the, the business I started seven years ago at the time that everybody was watching uh, uh, DVD and CD, right? And uh, actually uh, what's happening now that in terms of practical use cases, uh, imagine that uh, people will be able to get the tokens for the advertisement they're watching, right? So eventually, this is a practical use because all of a sudden they will understand what the token means if they could redeem it by, by buying the premium content. That's number one. Then technology should uh, uh, solve the problems. And for example, we all know that uh, our biggest revenue is coming from the advertisement and from the uh, uh, data, actually, right? The and data. 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 Yeah, our data. Yeah, yours and mine. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's for sale all the time. And uh, we know that the biggest program, uh, problem with the pro uh, programmatic advertisement is actually fraud. It accounts for $19 billion a year. And nobody is actually introducing smart contracts that are going to solve this problem. Because what happened in two parties, advertisers and the platforms, uh, actually don't trust each other much. This is the reason why big brands pull out of the programmatic advertisement. And this is what we're actually building by shifting our existing business, seven years old, to something which is going to be decentralized between the users, then you're going to be rewarded and no longer pay for the content. That's the uh, ultimate goal. And the advertiser will actually understand what's going on. And the content creators, because uh, uh, if you're content creators today, everybody said, yeah, go on YouTube. But do you know how much YouTube pays you as a content creator? We know it's only 3%. So 97% goes to the YouTube pocket, which is not really fair game. So this is what we're doing in terms of practical uh, cases yeah. when technologies actually can solve the real problems of the market and the, uh, uh, actually change the, the, the uh, business model and the total ecosystem. So I guess, Mark, just to add on your point, uh, I just want to ask a follow-up question, which is, I guess in 1999, Facebook was basically a, a, t a speculative technology, right? A way to, really that's what it was, just like a lot of these blockchain projects. Now, today it's a way to talk to people. It's a, it's a real usability. Do you see in 10 years, or how long, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, when will this blockchain technology become, call it seamlessly usable, just like our smartphone is today, where it's something that we use without thinking that it's different or new? Yeah, I think I, I can really clearly remember the times where uh, there were hundreds of search engines before Google appeared, right? And I think we're in a very similar situation. I mean, we have a few projects which are well known, a few ones, which are well known because they were just increasing their, their value, which doesn't automatically mean that they will succeed. And ultimately, I think uh, we don't see or we don't have the Google or Facebook of, of, of crypto yet. Um, or the LinkedIn or all the specific <laughs> niches as well. Because I guess here there would be a chance for some others to pop up. If they yeah, I think, see. I mean, ultimately it's like you have one tipping point and that's the good thing. Nobody really knows uh, when this tipping point is. That's why it's interesting to invest in this space. But then at this point it will suddenly kick off. And I mean, honestly, um, I mean, what kind of blockchain-based services are really used at the moment which we create some real value besides speculating and ICOs which are ultimately also speculation mainly and I think that's why we're talking about something which is still I mean ultimately not really used in the real world so we go back to the physical assets and the, and the digital assets there are not that many real life use cases so far right yeah. so that's why I think at least it takes at least 10 more years, but when you go back to 1999 and we we're in 2009, now we're to in 2018, 10 years is quite a long time if you're at the moment rather today, but looking back, it's, it's quite a short time frame. So I think it, it takes at least 10 to 15 years to really have some use cases where the technology doesn't matter and you really create some sustainable long-term added value. Uh, Ina, as, as someone who is launching a really exciting uh, ICO, new project tied to real assets, um, being that what it is, what have been your, I guess, your biggest unexpected challenges in the process of getting, of accomplishing that? 
and what have been maybe a few things that, you, that were positives yeah. of the process that you, you didn't, that you did not expect? So I'll start with the positive, oh, we're Israeli, we always <laughs> like to look at the bright side of things. So the positive thing is actually that many of the recent ICOs that happened, the utility tokens, they didn't actually have a real product. So they were saying, okay, we want to raise X amount of money in order to maybe in the future do the team, build a company, develop the product, and people just gave them the money to do it. And a lot of the ICOs kind of, you know, showed failures and didn't actually achieve their goals. So people became a bit more, you know, they have more tendency to work realistic things. And the positive things in our STO, which is a security token offering, is the fact that actually we have working power stations. So our investors can actually visit the facilities, uh, can actually see that the company is existing for seven years. It has a positive uh, track record. It has a very experienced team. So that's definitely a positive in terms of the situation right now. The negative is that I think that the blockchain, it had like a big hype like the dot-com bubble long time ago. So everybody wanted to invest in an ICO, everybody wanted to buy different coins, if it was dog coin or dentist coin, people were like running for it in order to make like a first, a first uh, pump and dump. And uh, right now I think people are, the technology is maturing and people are maturing more and they want to see more regulated tokens but there's not sufficient regulations for the security tokens, let's say. So on the one hand, everybody are tired from the utility tokens, but not sure how to approach the new type, which is the security tokens. So there's like a sort of a gap that creates, I think, a bit of a problem. Do you find it, um, do people find it surprising when they talk to you and they find out you're doing an ICO, mm -hmm. but you've had a successful business since 2011, yeah. and this is just an extension? Yeah. Um, is that something, I would imagine that's something that people are kind of surpri pleasantly surprised about when they talk to you. They're pleasantly surprised and also it's very, let's say, suitable to my entrepreneurial background because in 2011 when I went into wave energy, which was a new type of renewable energy, solar and wind were very, you know, everywhere and, and the wave energy was new, everybody was saying, stay away, why are you going there, you know, the sea is so dangerous, it's so expensive, everything would break down and I still like believed in it and went with my passion and build the first uh, power station of wave energy. The same with blockchain. Right now the situation is a bit kind of stay away. It's, it can create bad reputation. You have a successful business. Our company is going public now in a traditional way. Yep. So everybody is saying, why do you need also to do an STO? It might risk what you already have. But again, listen, I'm a big believer and a big adop adopter of uh, technologies, of innovation. And I think that the combination between renewable energy and blockchain can be amazing. And you know, I'm going with my passion. No, um, Mark, uh, when you're looking at potential opportunities in this blockchain market, I am, uh, what percentage of them would you say actually solve problems? Like real problems that are understandable to someone looking at it, and what percentage are, like you said, just about the technology and kind of archaic? And do you find the ones that will actually do, sol or the ones that are set out to solve problems, do you find them more interesting than the ones that are maybe leveraging a wave? Or is, is there a trend coming on now? Yeah, I think, I mean, hopefully most of the, of the people or founders behind ambitious blockchain-based projects somehow try to solve problems on the long run. But as I already said, I think on the short run, there are not that many which are really solving real-life problems at the moment. Uh, especially when you take away, as I already mentioned, the speculative parts and the ICO business. So that's why I think you have a few more obvious industries like the energy business, for example, everything which is somehow trade, trade finance related because that's already an existing industry where the blockchain technology just um, makes it more efficient and transparent. And then I would say ultimately, and that's why that's part of the reasons why I'm quite deep into the whole space, I think government is something which will be disrupted quite tremendously because I mean, at least serious governments, they're somehow based on trust, right? And I don't know, I mean, personally, I'd rather have uh, tech, technology, uh, political neutral, uh, trust-based solution than a politician I have to trust. So I think in that space, we see quite a few uh, changes. The question is, are there also valid business cases? So that's why I would say at the moment, you have a few industries where there's already an existing use case where you can implement blockchain and there you have a real life uh, problem which is solved at the moment as we speak but I would say more than 90% of the use cases are somehow 
in a very long perspective. So that's why, again, I think we're far behind the moment where we have the tipping point, where we have real solving problems behind. Andre? Well, I would definitely support the trend that existed businesses actually are going to be shifting in the uh, uh, token economy because they actually fundamentals reason for that. So we see the many cases like that and I believe it's good for the industry because now investors could actually compare with the companies that have existed businesses and products in comparison with the, with the new ones. In terms of the uh, investments, for example, in our portfolio company, Spinback Up, they actually doing the cloud-to-cloud -cloud storage for your data for uh, Google Apps. And obviously, they found the niche how to do the same for the uh, digital wallets. So this is just an example. One existing company actually shifting uh, uh, toward the uh, uh, digital and the blockchain space, uh, crypto space, by introducing the, the, the products that we actually need in order to build up this ecosystem. And where do you see, what, okay, what specific industries would you consider the low-hanging fruit for blockchain adoption to actually change things? Well, it's actually it's happening right now. The, uh, one of the biggest one is actually TV, video, and advertisement industry. And we see the uh, startups actually entering the, in this space. Uh, uh, I don't know if you heard the company Tata 2. They raised $575 million to just for that. Probably everyone in this room heard about this uh, uh, Pornhub uh, partnership with uh, uh, Wise uh, Industry Token to actually reward the users for watching uh, videos, etc. So it's, it's a very big one. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's almost $500 uh, billion industry. They have not been disrupted yet, in my mind. And uh, uh, as I said, the uh, blockchain technology have a practical use in solving the biggest problem in this industry. They're coming from piracy, to the uh, fraud in advertisement, and so on and so on. I, now, I've tried, for example, to use like my ether and the private key, and it, it's not that intuitive. When do you think that there's going to need to be, like, everyone knows how to access online banking now, to move money that way. Uh, do you expect either, either the, the way it's used to get simpler, or do you think the people will get smarter and so that more people can work with the technology and adopt it. I think honestly people normally don't get smarter. Um, I mean I, when I look back, uh, I mean it's not that long time ago where we really had to literally dial in to be online, right? I mean back in the early days you, you had to dial a certain yeah. number to go online and then the telephone was blocked. Uh, so you had to compete against the landline and I think um, Suddenly now the internet is everywhere, right? We have Wi-Fi and, and so nobody cares about dialing in into the internet. And I think we have, again, we are not at this point yet, but at a, at a certain level it will be similar with blockchain applications. You don't care about uh, my ether or any of these entry barriers which are still quite complex. I mean, honestly, I don't know my, my mom and dad. Uh, they don't have any cryptos just because it's fairly too complex for them. And I think it's not the intention or it shouldn't be the intention of an industry to educate people. It should be just as easy and the entry barrier should be as low as possible so that, like the internet, the blockchain is just everywhere, right? But this will also take some more time. Yes. <laughs> I can add something. Continue. Yes, Ina, please add. <laughs> so I think it's very important that when we're actually digitalizing the assets and when companies are starting to use the blockchain technology for the digitalization and liquidity in the assets, that they make it like in a logical way. I was just uh, last week in a Pictet summit, a Pictet Bank summit, and they had like a big, uh, you know, session about uh, blockchain. And there was a company there that uh, wanted to, they own a Van Gogh painting, and they actually wanted to tokenize it. So basically, they're selling different pieces of the painting in, you know, through uh, tokenization. So one person owns the ear, of, the ear in the picture, one owns the eyes, one owns the nose. Like, this type of uh, activity, I don't really understand. You know, it might sound interesting that, like, it gives access to everybody to find art. But, like, what would they do with this token? Like, meet once a year and put the full, the full painting on the wall? And if one of them is sick, like, you don't have, you know, you don't have one of the parts of the 
like the nose is not coming, so you can have the full painting. So that's an industry, let's say art, I don't think that should be tokenized in the way that they're trying to do now. But industries like uh, they mentioned, of uh, data, of uh, videos, of energy, of like different industries that already exist and can benefit from it, I think it's something that, uh, you know, the process will only grow with the time and the tokenization of the assets will only become more, you know, better and more comfortable for use and so on. So, uh, typically when industries grow, especially in digital economies like uh, me media or intellectual property, uh, over time everything comes into the hands of a few. You know, Microsoft pro owns so many patents that some companies make their business suing Microsoft just to, yep. just to try to get some of that technology. Uh, there's large media companies like Viacom that probably own 40% of television shows out there and things like that. A lot of the big benefits of blockchain right now is the free-for-all, everyone can join democracy, but what's stopping it from becoming regulated and then consolidated so that a few at the top can easier pick, you know, clean up the rest of the market? Well, that's actually the power of decentralization. When the power comes not only to the uh, single players, but actually to engage in consumers and different uh, players of the market. And when actually the, all the business models were clear in terms of uh, uh, who gets what, okay? And I call it service model because we don't know how much the company is actually making, what are the margins right now, and they actually squeeze the different players in order to get the bigger margins, mm -hmm. okay, which is not fair. And this is what the, the beauty of decentralization when actually everybody understands the clear picture what, uh, uh, who's making what, and what, and, for, and, and return for what. So I believe that the centralization model is essential, right? So all market participants will see the, the values that will not change and, and not be abused by different uh, market players. Like because we say that YouTube and Netflix are, are, are new rivals that change the market, and I tell you, they are monopolies. Okay, they are monopolies, and uh, talk to the content creators, talk to the many people, they will tell you that. So, but what's to stop people from someone successful in the space to acquire other companies that control other technologies and execute the exact same model that's happened in almost every growing industry? Well, we live in free world, and uh, actually, that may happen for sure. But uh, once again, uh, if you delegate the power to also to consumers, per se, right, I believe it's going to be a big shift. Because currently, one of the reasons why we don't see many successful companies going for ICOs, for one pure reasons, because the investors, they control them, just don't allow that. So this is why, I don't know in your case, but in our case, because I'm a majority shareholder in my company, I was able to convince my other partners to do the, 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 the ICO uh, or do the token, economic, uh, to, uh, token uh, economics for my company. But uh, in many cases, all these companies are very slow because they already have existed commitments with existing traditional investors, which actually uh, gives the opportunity for startups and for new companies to disrupt them because they're more flexible right now. Are there, are there any things that someone uh, in the economy that kind of keeps you up at night, just knowing if this one rule changes, this could kill my business? Or do you see any huge like, potential uh, barriers that, that ch changes, for example, that a regulator could make or whoever it is that would really affect specific businesses? Well, it's happening all the time because governments wants to control the internet and the internet business as well, and we are part of it, right? So basically, it comes to the, to the, what the countries want, right? For example, some countries want to protect their own companies, right? That's the reason why uh, China is very protective uh, in terms of their market. But overall, I think that uh, uh, because technology is not related to the regulation per se, and I believe this is the reason why we are uh, able to do very great things because we are not regulated to do so, right? If internet would be regulated from day one, I'm not sure that we would have see the companies like we see today. So this is the beauty of it. Of course, I, I, I see the opposite trend when the countries are trying to actually not regulate but create the environment to attract entrepreneurs from crypto and blockchain space, right? 
just because they are more flexible or more competitive with other countries, right? This is what's happening. Uh, as, I, as I call, currently we have a, 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 ch a worldwide championship on the blockchain and crypto when countries compete with each other how to actually attract the guys and sitting in this room to do something in their country. So this is what's happening and I believe it's a good trend. So on the way uh, flying in, or do something to add, Mark? Yeah, I mean, as, um, as we just heard, I think technology is agnostic, right? So mm -hmm. technology doesn't care about politics and normally technology also succeeds because it's just nobody can stop uh, something which makes sense. So it's again about governments, politics. I think uh, we, what we see right now is regulatory arbitrage. We are in a time where uh, smart entrepreneurs can literally move out of a space in immediately and uh, continue their business uh, on a different continent. And I think that's why um, we, we're in, in very exciting times because, I mean, you have big countries trying to regulate it, which also makes sense from their perspective, but they will miss part of the future technology and some certain trends. So that's why I think uh, it's interesting. I, as I already said, I rather bet on technology than on uh, politicians. So on, on, the, on the way here, I was listening to a podcast between uh, Joe Rogan and uh, Peter Schiff. Peter Schiff made a very interesting argument. Uh, it might be self-serving, but an argument nonetheless, that uh, cryptocurrencies, in essence, have no uh, intrinsic value. And therefore, over time, they can become worthless. However, the only ones that can have value are ones tied to physical assets. He also sells a gold a coin sold to gold, so obviously he ha thinks this way, but he did make a very good argument. So I'd like to start with Ina on how you feel about that statement. Listen, I think that the whole cryptocurrency market came from kind of a, you know, a small feeling of rebellion among the population, like they don't want everything to be centralized by the local banks, by the local government, by the local institutions that they know. So a new currency kind of that is more, you know, controlled by the people was created, which is, I'm not sure, I don't think it will lose value over time, we will see. I know that certain governments are working on actually creating their own cryptocurrency, so it might be that they will be very heavily accepted, which will create a lower value for the existing cryptocurrencies. Like, it's not exactly, it's difficult to forecast something like that, because you see there's a lot of uh, fluctuation also in the prices of this type of, uh, you know, cryptocurrency. So it's like, I don't think anybody knows if it's going to go up, if it's going to go down. Like the person that spoke uh, before us from Bitcoin Cash said he sees that it's going down to 5,000 by the end of the year, but it might as well be at 20,000. So like, we don't really know how to forecast these things. Regarding the ones that have assets behind them, I think it's a bit more safe. Like in the terms that, you know, the asset always has a certain value. So if you were attaching a house to it or a power station and it costs uh, $10 million, then always, you know, the value of that tokens will be $10 million. So, and has growth potential from the revenues that are happening from the increase in the actual standard market. So there's a big advantage in the kind of uh, attaching an actual asset to something the less fluctuation and, uh, you know, the, it's easier to forecast and to deal with, but I don't think that the actual cryptocurrency will disappear. And then, Mark, what are your feelings on intrinsic value, the topic of intrinsic value when it relates to physical and digital, and we'll call it and blockchain assets? Yeah, I mean, I would say I spent two-thirds of my time in crypto assets, so I have quite a dedicated view. And, I mean, just to give you one uh, concrete example, I mean, I'm in the board of a company called Crypto Finance Group in Switzerland. We're roughly 40 people doing crypto asset management, brokerage and storage for institutional clients. And when I see what kind of investors we're onboarding as we speak, some of the richest people on earth, some families, they preserve their wealth over generations. And they move into this space because they see that crypto assets are here to stay and they're becoming a new asset class, something which was not existing so far. And also interesting to see, I mean, one of our main backers is a, is a very successful um, hedge fund billionaire. So how many hedge fund uh, guys you have in the market and you now can say, okay, they're speculators. Yeah, that's right. They're in for the money. That's also right. But at least they want to earn money, right? And ultimately, I think when you look at the profile of, of people joining the space now, and we're not talking about crazy geeks and crypto whales and whatever, really boring people from the traditional space. I think that's a very good indication that this intrinsic value 
is definitely existing. And I mean, if you, if you have an argue like that, I think then you should also talk about what's the intrinsic value of fiat money, right? And you don't have to go that far and that uh, way back in history to realize that uh, I think it would be an interesting argument to also uh, challenge uh, the intrinsic value of, of the fiat money, right? So that is actually, in Peter Schiff's argument, the, the point, that his one weakness is that he also described it in, I guess, 1971 when they took a, off the gold standard, then fiat money really doesn't have much intrinsic value either. So it's almost like what's worse, right? One versus the other. So I, I can definitely see that point. Yeah, and then, I mean, honest, ultimately it's trust, right? Trust in something which is digital. I mean, we have coins and notes, but ultimately behind it's also something quite virtual, right? So if you trust in something and other ones trust in the same as well, I mean, even gold, you can touch it, but I mean, besides the um, history of mankind, there's no real reason why, why gold uh, is stable just because um, yeah, we define it as a, as a standard to attach uh, value to it, right? So that's why it really goes, and that's something I like in this whole space, it goes into quite fundamental questions of, of economy and society. Exactly, though. You mentioned that uh, wealthy, high net worth individuals, we'll just say, call it Mr. Biltmore, goes to uh, invest in cryptocurrencies through you. He's, say, a billionaire. What's the biggest percentage of a high net worth individual you've seen himself, who's, who has, call it, let's say, tr old money, traditional wealth, what's the biggest percentage of their wealth you've seen someone actually put into the crypto economy? Yeah, I would, I would take as an example, I mean, normally it's like a portfolio diversification, right? And what we see is they take mainly their gold position or their commodity position and uh, take part of it and move it into crypto. And I would say the conservative approach would be one or two percent of your commodity or gold exposi uh, um, and position, which could still be a huge amount. And the more offensive ones, I mean, they can, uh, we had guys, uh, they went up to 30, 40 percent of their, of their gold position, which is very aggressive, I would say. Uh, Andre, w what are your feelings on the intrinsic value in, call it, say, fiat and crypto? Okay, let me, let me ask you this. Why some art objects are valued a hundred million dollars and some of those are, you can buy for five dollars here on the street? Why? Based on how much uh, money people have that they need yeah, yeah, to why? wander through art yeah. or something. And in my view, it's because of perception and demand. The two things that actually drive this price because from the, maybe from taste, uh, my taste, I would not even buy it for five dollars, but some people paid uh, hundreds of million dollars for some piece of art, right? So, the perception of value and the demand for it is going to drive the market. And don't forget, we still, in a very, uh, very early stage, we are building the infrastructure of this world, right? And of course, the guys that actually not only diversified their portfolio, but actually betting on this space, like they done in like 20 years with, with the internet was just emerging. The same happened right now. But uh, as I said, the, we are still in the early stage and the perception that we're going to build some, something new, something else is going to actually drive demand for many people actually invested in, 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 the, in the companies that eventually are going to build something valuable. And perception is also the key. I just make an example. Ina, do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, listen, I think that recently we also should see that a lot of institutional investors, that they weren't looking in the past at crypto, they were not looking at blockchain at all, you know, they said it's too risky, it's too innovative, they, they want to stay away from it. But banks like Morgan and Stanley, for example, they bought a lot of uh, cryptocurrency after they came out publicly and said, listen, we don't believe in it, don't buy it, it's too dangerous. The prices fell down after their analyst said it and they purchased the biggest amount the next day. So yes. it shows you that actually, you know, the fact that institutions are going into it and actually investing in it, it's showing that there is like a growing acceptance and growth. And just one more thing, I think that the more traditional industry, like you said, the old fashioned business people and old fashioned like uh, high net worth individuals, they're used to invest in very traditional industries. So the more the traditional industries will use towards that direction, the more we will get 
higher percentage of investors in the, that field, yeah. like he said, more than one and two percent. It almost seems like a new commodity of sorts, just mm -hmm. like uh, art, for example, is a commodity. It's traded very slowly, so there's less price discovery. Uh, there's more price discovery in the, in the crypto market, but it, it's really acting the same way a new currency would act or a new uh, pork barrel contract that's of some new commodity that just entered an exchange where it's very erratic and then should soon smooth out. Are there any indicators that we should look out for in the crypto community that will say to us, we've actually hit that next level of adoption, maturity, and, and what would those indicators be? Like, what are the signs that we're actually progressing towards the blockchain economy? Yeah, I would say the more you hear from very traditional high-level people that it's a scam and not sustainable, the, the better the indication is because we exactly had the same in the, in the internet industry before. And it's also interesting, I mean, uh, our CEO, we were in a, at the conference in, in California last week and our CEO, Crypto Finance Group had a dinner with the CFO of Goldman Sachs and it was one day after the media released a statement that Goldman Sachs is moving out of crypto which was uh, corrected the next day and I mean what I heard from the discussions they had that these guys they're really now seriously moving into all this space and that's why I also say they're in for the money, they're speculators, they don't care about technology, they want change, they want to change the world to the good but Ultimately, that's always part of a real business, right? That, uh, that uh, ugly bad guys are moving in. And uh, I think that's what we're seeing at the moment. Uh, on the other hand, you have a lot of politicians and traditional law policy makers which are completely against it. But I mean, honestly, the whole crypto economy fights a little bit the existing ecosystem. So it's natural that politicians lawmakers and other, other ones are against it because it destroys a little bit their uh, status quo. So I think that's one of the big differentiators to the internet. I mean, you had also some very big industries. They were all too late to realize how disruptive this power is. And the digital revolution is still uh, changing quite a few things. But with crypto, you really go into the heart of society and economy. So it's quite natural that a lot of people don't like what's happening and they have very valid arguments why um, it's not sustainable. So I think every time you read about serious people uh, fighting against uh, this uh, new asset class, um, I think it's a good indication that we're moving into the right direction. Andre, looks like you had something to add. Well, I agree with Mark that uh, once we have the long-term investors step in in the field, it's going to be much better and much healthier for the industry because it was dominated by the short-term investors, right? flippers or speculative guys. And it's like in venture capital, right? The venture capital have built the industry because the people have been thinking like uh, 10 years old, uh, 10 years long investments. And I believe once we get uh, guys uh, join us in what we've been doing, it's going to be much healthier for the industry. It's going to be a big indicator, right? In terms of that uh, our industry is becoming the uh, mature and involved. I just want to add to what Andre said. I think the easiest way to see that the industry is mature is when the fluctuation, the big fluctuation that is existent will stop. And this will be directly created, like Andre said, from long-term investors. Because at the moment people buy the different uh, cryptocurrencies mm -hmm. or the different tokens and they buy it in a kind of a pump and dump way. You know, you buy it, you want it to go 1000% up in its value and then you sell it right away. So then it doesn't let the industry to stabilize and then it creates a lot of, uh, you know, fear around the industry. So the same like the industry of, again, the dot-com bubble has stabilized, you know, you have the big companies like Amazon, like eBay, that are worth a lot of money, but their price, their share price is not jumping Between on a daily basis. one in a thousand over the past. Exactly. Just to exactly. exactly. So the same, exactly. Yeah. The Apple same has dropped 50% multiple times. Yeah, but it drops from, there's a certain reason that causes the drop usually, like Apple tried to make a new product and it didn't sell as expected or, uh, you know, then you have a big drop in the price. It's a bit more organized and they have a lot of these companies have long-term investors. So they're not like selling out after one week of holding the share sure, or the yeah. token. In our, in this industry, in the blockchain industry, again, like Andre correctly said, most of the investors, at least from the public, are very short-term investors. So they don't have the patience to let like the company or let the token, you know, 
grow sufficiently to reach that stable phase. So a good sign will be when they will stop fluctuating, I think. Andre? Uh, because from the company perspective, uh, how are you supposed to launch the product in three months and actually create the natural demand for the token? It's just impossible. We have this gap, right? So you need some time to actually make, uh, make it work for your business from the fundamental perspective. And the people just don't care about it, right? They don't see the fundamentals value uh, behind it. Even on the fundraising pr uh, market now, we see uh, investors saying, oh, you, inv you are raising $100 million. It's too much. You need to raise 10. And I understand why they, they, they're trying to push you down to 10, because they want to get the upside immediately. And they don't care that for 10, you cannot just trap the industry with the uh, billions of dollars that uh, your competitors, ha your competitors have raised. So this is a gap, but, it is, but to bridge this gap, we need the more uh, long-term investors that actually understand what's going on from a fundamental perspective. So, and in order to do that, you'd say there needs to be more real businesses that are That's right. tied to it, and yeah. you, they need to clean out the, the crap. Exactly. Yeah, because the regulating, kind of just clean it up in a way that doesn't kill it. Yes, that's right. We didn't know it's allowed to say crap on stage. <laughs> I'm joking. Now it's two of us, so. <laughs> um, I guess before we turn it over to uh, the audience for questions, I wanted to give each of you a chance to talk about one specific blockchain project that's of particular interest to you and excites you right now. So start with, I guess, Andre. What excites me right now? Uh, one specific crypto uh, project. Maybe it's a new coin. Maybe it's something you're invested in, and just it, that's exciting. It makes you very excited right now, and just why? Well, I believe, uh, as I said, we invested in the uh, security companies because obviously the security is a big issue for crypto, right? From different standpoints, and this is uh, uh, actually going to be a big industry because it's solving the problem today, not in the future. So this is why, as I said, we're looking in, the, in this space and uh, our company is actually building real products in this particular place. What was the name of the company? This, this company named Spin Backup. Nice. They're doing cloud to cloud, cloud uh, storage solution for the, for the uh, digital wallets. And they have an upcoming coin offering or? Not, not yet. Not yet. Okay. And then Mark? They build in the, oh, okay, this is, a, this is very interesting. They build the product first, right? They get the first customer. And then they will probably go for the for the for the ICO, etc. Very traditional, right? <laughs> it's, it is traditional, right? Because they want to. Th yeah, you're right. They want to introduce the product first to get adoption. Is that, yeah. Mark. Yeah, I mean, I I have a few fields. I mean, I like the tokenization of real assets. I'm involved in a few companies in this field. Uh, tokenization of art, tokenization of real estate. I think. There are just so many ways, tokenization of private equity venture capital, which make it far more efficient. I'm also a big believer in the security token space, supporting also a team in, uh, in uh, Lithuania, Desico. They're very passionate about building a platform for all the security tokens. So I think, as you just mentioned, I think we, we, we were in the Wild Wild West, which is nice, and a lot of people made a lot of money. Uh, more people lost even more money. But now it's becoming a, a serious marketplace. And I think, the, I mean, the cases are becoming quite regularly. They first create a product. They try to get customers about, uh, on board. They even raise equity money. So I think we see a, a lot of very boring stuff happening, which is a good thing, because it means that the whole noise and buzz and, 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 and uh, shit around it is moving out of the space. Enough. So I'm going to be a bit biased, so I, I like, of course, our project, which is the EcoWave coin, because <laughs> uh, as discussed uh, before, listen, it has actual assets uh, attached to it, it wouldn't have that much of a fluctuation, but on the other hand, you have a growing amount of power stations that we're building, uh, so all the time, you know, you will see a growth in the token value because you keep reinvesting the revenues from the electricity sale in more and more assets. So the number of tokens never grows, but the number of assets that are attached to it keep growing. So I think... Uh, Again, this is my personal passion, so that's and the when point. do you expect to do the offering for that? So we're actually, because we're a security token, we need to list on specific exchanges, so we're in discussion with the GSX in Gibraltar, which is doing now a, a security platform, a, a platform for trading of security tokens, which is called the GBX, so we're going to be probably listed there and a few other security exchanges, so probably first or second quarter of 2019, we're going to officially launch for the general public. Great, and then I guess now would be the time to turn it over to audience questions. 
Don't be shy. Everybody is happy. Thanks for the talk. Um, I think a couple of you mentioned how it would be great for the space when traditional investors get involved who have a longer time frame and longer time frame for you know, investments as opposed to people like me who are more speculative. But like even the best VCs, they invest in so many companies and the returns on their funds really come from one or two outstanding players. So why do you think it's so important for these long-term investors to come into the space? And why would that be so much better than the public getting involved? Listen, you're right. Even in the traditional industry, 80% of the startups, they uh, fail actually and bankrupt in the first two years of operation. So it's something that we can, you're right, VCs invest in many different startups and they make like, they got, get like the unicorn out, maybe one out of 100 or 1,000. So it's true that you need to spread the investment in order to be able to, you know, catch or find a good company. But the reason for the unicorn to be able to develop, for the, this huge startups to be able to develop to a unicorn, is the fact that they have these VCs standing for the long term, like believing in them, supporting the company. If the company just raised one time the money and she knows that nothing, like the company knows that nothing stands behind it, there's no like actual strategic investors or long term investors, it's just one time they got the money, they have to do a product, either it will work or it will not, I think it takes down the chances to create these big like unicorns that were created in the traditional industry. But that's my personal. Andre. Well, yeah, you're absolutely right. From the VC perspective, you need to build a portfolio. And of course, uh, uh, the biggest returns are coming from the uh, uh, unicorns. At least if you have one in the portfolio, then you're going to be above the average in terms of your return in the industry. But let's be realistic. Uh, how much time it takes to build a company, right? It takes up to 10 years, right? You cannot do it overnight. And this is the reason why the venture capital investors, they don't know at the very beginning, right, what the company is going to be success, successful or not. So you need to actually bet in the, in the long run and to see what's happened because it's a very competitive industry. Otherwise, you will not uh, get the value, right, if you're not going to think that way. Because fundamentally, as we said, the company needs to solve the problem, right? You need to solve the real fundamental problem. Otherwise, it's not going to be the successful company. Yeah, and I think it's also a little bit about the lining of interest, right? I mean, if I invest in a company, I want to have passionate founders which are in for the game at least for five to whatever years. Right. And ultimately, I think investors, at least the long-term ones, should think the same, right? I mean, that's something I, I, I didn't really, it's changing now, but I didn't or don't really like about this crypto space, that founders think if they have a one-year vesting of their tokens, they're already committed to a project. I mean, being an entrepreneur myself, if you really want to build something big, and that's what you see at the real iconic role models like Mark Zuckerberg and other ones, I mean, that's like their life project, right? They're in for the whole life, ultimately. So if you don't have a five to ten year perspective as a founder and an investor, I think then uh, you miss a little bit the whole point about uh, creating a sustainable long-term company. Any more questions? Yeah. Hello, everybody. Um, how do you think why investors regarding the blockchain uh, pay so much attention about the economics, about the marketing, the technology itself, and uh, the science itself and scientific projects they left uh, under-evaluated and they fail to collect uh, necessary funds because actually it's the matter of not only the economics but also about the, our future. Thanks. Well, if I understand correctly the question in terms of technology and the scientific projects, why they raise them different? Because the simple answer would be the technology still stands for 20% of the business, right? The technology is good, but if you're uh, don't see how you're going to actually build the business and the technology, then it's very hard to actually uh, raise capital. That's, that's an un honest answer. You need to focus on the customers and the demand and the revenues, right? 
And actually, technology is a deployment of that, not vice versa. Actually, scientists, they are not entrepreneurs, so they need exactly. some help. That's why, that's why we invested not in the projects per se, this to, to, to your point, we invested in the people that actually create the businesses, create the products. And the scientists are very important member uh, team members and their team. But there's going to be different skill set. That's why we have a project that usually three founders, right? One is go for IT, the other for sales and marketing, and so on and so on. So we love this. Uh, uh, synergies in the team because it's going to take the long run to build this com very competitive business and we as investors we're not just silently putting money into the company we are very hands-on right in helping to build this company and we have a, a, a narrative uh, to do this for five seven years together with the founders so it's like playing coach right we're just sharing our knowledge in order to help you to build the company when technology is important but it's just a part of the the, the process Thank you. Experts and researchers and analysts say that the market is driven mainly, some say purely, by emotion. Do you believe this to be true? And do you think this will always be a factor in the uh, cryptocurrency market? I think it's partly true, but it's the same in traditional markets, right? I mean, what we see right now is crazy that uh, also at the, the, the high level investors I mentioned, if you're in for the long run, I think you should move in now, but everybody thinks he misses the ultimate point to get in. So I think the whole psychological element is a big part of it, but honestly we have it in every other traditional liquid market. I mean, even if you go to the Forex market, the most liquid market, there are so many emotional uh, driven aspects of it. So yeah, I think that's just uh, how the financial market works in general. I would add that uh, emotion supplies for the retail investors, right? They just see some like it or not. But even for the uh, institutional investors, we also, because uh, we have a very limited time to make a decision, so sometimes we make a decision on who is already invested in that company, who are the lead investors in that company, because we don't have time for due diligence, et cetera, et cetera. So it also, uh, on one hand, is emotional, right? Because you're actually betting on somebody else's trust, right? And you deal just in terms of projects that you don't even know. So it's also kind of uh, downside of our work because we need to make many investments and the time is very valuable, uh, very valuable for us. As we say, venture capitals and, and the business of saying no, right? We need to say no very quickly so we save time for those that we need actually to support. My other question is um, you're advocating or you're talking about um, trying to bring in long-term large investors into the uh, blockchain and crypto space to make it, um, to improve it. Wouldn't this threaten the concept, the philosophy behind cryptocurrency and blockchain which is decentralization and the empowerment of the people? Not exactly, because if you look at the fund, right, we, we, we call it investors, but investors invest from the fund, right? And the fund itself is a vehicle of commitments from investors, and the venture capital is usually 10 years old commitment, right? So basically the fund managers are uh, uh, actually investing the money of investors for long term, right? And uh, in order to attract the other investors, we need success stories, right? This is also downside, because if you, want, you need to attract money, you need to show success today. And this is the reason why the many investors are trying to get the success today, because also in fundraising process, to actually convince traditional investors to put money in, in, in these funds, right? So, and this is uh, uh, why I think it's not going to be dominated by the, the, the investors, because it's still a redistribution of capital uh, coming to the different vehicles, which are funds. No, but ultimately I think it's a good question. I mean, everybody talked about decentralization and democratization and literally we have the big miners and the big players now joining the whole game. I think that's just also part of reality that uh, even with a decentralized technology, it's not a different world, right? I mean, it could be, it might be also that it should be, but it's just not how uh, humans work or society and economy works. But I, I believe in competition between investors. So this is actually how we solve the problem. 
when versus compete is a decentralization of power. Um, I have a question to Ina. You mentioned that there is, I'm here, that there is, a, <laughs> right here, uh, that there is an actual connection in your case between the physical asset, as, assets being the renewable projects yeah. and the digital assets being the tokens. Mm -hmm. So how is this connection actually established? Because you mentioned that the investor can come and see and explore the project, but presumably the investor doesn't actually have any rights over the project. And how is the connection actually established? Is it just by way of the promise of the company that the performance of, of the token will be linked to the performance of the project? Or is there something else which establishes this connection? So as opposed to previous uh, aspect uh, tokens that were done, where you're right, actually, the investor didn't have any, any real connection to the asset. They actually had the connection to the rights in the asset, like right, a right to a dividend, right to a future something or a growth of value. Uh, what we're doing is a bit different. We're actually establishing the connection. We want the people to hold the actual pieces of assets that they invested in. So if it would be an apartment, you would own like, let's say, 1% of that apartment. You can own 1% of an actual power station. And that, I think, is something that is really like, interesting and cool because it was never tried or done in the energy sector before. Like, right, all the big power stations, you see them being funded by governments, by huge institutional investors. Right, you don't have a chance as a private person to say, I want to change the world, I want to support renewable energy, and actually co-own a power station. So actually by our project, that's what we're doing. We're letting people own the actual asset. Without the, just, you're only owning the rights and you cannot say anything. You know? Anyone else? All right, thank you for your time, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.